Well, thank you again, everyone, for being with us. It's, it is absolutely beautiful here. Uh, we haven't had rain, I guess, in a week or so, and the, the grass is starting to brown out. But that means I haven't had to mow it, so I'm happy about that. Uh, probably in the low to mid 90s every day, and uh, the only thing is, is we, we've got some pretty high humidity. So I hope it's beautiful um, where, wherever you happen to be today. And we know that right now there are some some parts of the country where people are dealing with fires and floods and other natural events, and we will trust for them and know for them today that whatever they need has already been provided, and whatever food or clothing or new houses or whatever has already been provided, and that in the divine mind everything is okay and it is unfolding okay in their lives. What we want to talk about today, the, the title is Awakening from the Dream of Separation, and that is something that comes to us from Buddhist teachings, the dream of separation. Now, Dr. Holmes put it a little bit differently, but I believe means the same thing, and he says all of our problems, all the problems that we face in, in our lives come from a belief in duality, that we believe that there's, there's a power for good and a power for evil, we believe that there's a, a God over there and there's us over here, and we're separated from it. So this dream of separation and this belief in duality, to me, seem to be the same. And Emma Curtis Hopkins, in her teaching, she put it, she put it another way that really struck home when I read it. She said that we believe that there's a mixture of evil in our idea of good. We believe that there's good, but, but there's also evil somehow contained in that good. And you'll see this if you listen to, um, to different speakers, if you read different books. People say, well, you know, you know God is good, but God allows, allows the devil to, to tempt us, or, or God sends us pain and suffering to teach us lessons and things like that. And that's what Emma Curtis Hopkins talks about. There's a mixture of evil in this idea of good. We, we believe that there's that God is all that there is and God is everywhere present, but yet we believe that there's pockets of lack and limitation and of ignorance and, and all of those things. So I believe all these different teachers, if, if we pay attention, if we look back far enough, if we kind of take their, their, the thread of their thoughts, of their, of their philosophy, and we work them back, they are all trying to tell us the same thing. At least I perceive it that way. They're trying to tell us the same thing. Wake up. Wake up. It's time to wake up. When the Buddha reached enlightenment, the, the story goes that he went into a village and, and somebody looked at him and they could, they could see by his demeanor that he was different. And they said, you know, what are you? Are you a god? Are you a saint? And what are you? And Buddha's response was, I am awake. I am awake. I have awakened. So this concept of enlightenment, this concept of awakening, this concept of salvation, they're all trying to bring us to, to the same, same place, I think, which is to awaken to our spiritual nature, to awaken to the Christ within, the presence of the divine within, to accept, to accept our unity with all that there is, with all of the goodness that there is, with all of the power that there is. So we hear the words, you know, we hear the words, but yet we're stuck, we're stuck in the experience. We're stuck in the experience. And, and to me, it's like, if you ever, ever been on a vacation and you, and you had a really great vacation, you know, and you come back home and it's Sunday night and you're trying to get everything ready for the morning, the kids ready for school, yourself ready for work, you're trying to get everything prepared and you, you go to sleep and you fall into a deep, deep sleep, you know, and you dream that you're still on vacation. Maybe if you were on a cruise, you know, you can still feel the ship rocking beneath you. You know, you can, you can hear the sound of the waves. You can feel the, the sun coming down on your, on your face as you're laying on the deck. You can feel a, a cold beverage in your hand, you know, and as you're just sitting there sipping something delightful in the heat of the day. You can, you can sm smell the smells of, uh, of the ship and the sea. And then all of a sudden the clock goes off, you know. <laughs> you know Whoa, what is this, you know? What is this? I have to awaken. I have to awaken. And we don't want to. You know, we want to stay in that dream. You 
perhaps the dream is very pleasant and we don't we we don't want to come out of it. We know it's just a dream. You know, we're starting to wake up and we realize, you know, oh God, I was I was just dreaming. You know, I was I wasn't really back on the ship. But nevertheless, we have to awaken. We have to awaken. So we pull ourselves kind of out of out of our sleep. We pull ourselves out. We're very groggy. You know, our heart is not in it. <laughs> We'd really rather crawl back into bed and go back into that dream. But we must awaken. We must awaken. We know we have to. We know we know we have to get out of bed. We know we have to go. You know, it's like the old joke about about the mother calling the son to wake up and go to school. And he said, "Mom, I don't want to go to school today." She said, "You have to go to school today." He said, "Mom, I don't. I don't want. I I don't want to go to school today." She said, "You have to go to school today." He said, "Why do I have to go to school today?" She says, two reasons." She says, "One, you're 45 years old, and two, you're the principal. Now get out of bed." We don't want to get out of it. We don't want to get out of, out, of, out of that dream. We want to stay there. We don't want to get up and go do the things that we know that we have to do. And I think there's, a, there's an analogy there in, in terms of our spiritual life. We eventually come to the point where we know we have to awaken. We know that that's what it's all about. That this, this awakening, this spiritual enlightenment, this this release of duality, this eliminating the mixture in our idea of good, that that's really what we have to do. That's what we are here to do. And yet it's it's difficult for us to come out of the dream. It's difficult. We're so used to this dream. We have, we have been in this dream for so long that there's a part of us that doesn't want to let go. If you remember the movie, uh, the, the Matrix, the first Matrix movie, it was all about how human beings were, <clears throat> were stuck in a dream and the dream was being controlled by the machines and the machines were just using the, the human beings for their energies. They were using human beings like batteries. But every once in a while, somebody would, somebody would awaken from the dream. Somebody would realize that that had only been a dream and they would start to come into a, a different awakening, a different reality. And there was one character who wanted to go back. He, he wanted to go back to the dream. And he went. He was he was kind of negotiating with the dream masters. He was going to give them information they needed, but he wanted them to put put him back in a dream, and never let him awaken. If he could go back in the dream, and never realize that it was a dream, but to just be living the rest of his life in whatever dreamlike fantasy they were going to program for him, he would be perfectly happy. But if he ever awakened, you see, if he ever had to awaken again, he didn't want to do that. It, w it would be too, too hard for him to come back and to realize that all of that had been a dream. So he was telling them, just put me asleep and never let me wake up, never let me come out of the dream. And I think as we go as we go through our spiritual awakening, as we start to grow, we kind of struggle with this. We're we're in this world, but we're not of this world. We're starting to recognize the spiritual nature of of our own selves. Selves. We're starting to recognize the spiritual nature of the universe. We're starting to recognize that things are not really as they appear to us that this is in many respects a, a dream. We go to sleep at night and we have one level of dreaming and we believe it's real. We interact with it, we engage with it. If something's chasing us, our heart beats fast, you know. If something enjoyable is going on, we enjoy it. We're on our cruise and we're just having a, a good old time. And we believe it's real. We're caught in the dream. And then we wake up and we go to work or we go do whatever it is that we do during the day. And we're really dreaming at a different level. It seems more real to us. It seems firmer and more tangible than when we were asleep. But we have to recognize that both are nothing more than projections of our own consciousness. Right? All of the characters in the dreams, we created them. 
and in the waking world we have to start to realize that the people who come into our lives are in by invitation by right of consciousness that everything is kind of a symbol everything is kind of pointing us back to a deeper truth and we have to awaken from the belief that this dream is real that this experience is real that it is the only experience we have to awaken to our spiritual nature so let's talk a little bit about uh, involution evolution and how we got this way and then let's talk about how these ideas of separation and duality and mixture of good and evil manifest in our world and then let's talk about what we can do in order to to break the cycle to break free to step out of it so if we read if we read Fenwick Holmes in his his uh, work being and becoming he talks about the absolute and the relative that that the divine mind is absolute but our human experience is relative perhaps the Buddhist would call this conditioned experience you know, it's a conditioned experience it's not it's not completely real but it is a reaction and a reflection of of our own ideas our own consciousness in the world of the absolute there's only primary cause but in the world of the relative we have secondary causation <clears throat> if you think if you think of uh, the balls on a pool table the cue stick hits the white ball the cue ball and the cue ball then hits another ball and then that ball hits yet another ball and that last ball goes into the pocket and if you're standing there at the pocket and all you can see is is the last two balls you say well well this ball hit that ball and it went in the pocket and that's true but that's secondary causation ultimately what caused it was the cue stick hitting the cue ball but what moved the cue stick well there was a person holding the cue stick why did they move the cue stick they had an intention they had an as Fenwick might call the involution the idea I'm going to do this involution the cue stick hit the cue ball and the ball start rolling on the table that's evolution that's evolution the primary cause was the intention of the person holding the cue stick to strike the ball to try to sink that one in the corner pocket the evolution was the cue stick hitting the cue ball and the cue ball hitting a ball and then a, that ball hitting another ball and so on and so on until the ball drops in the pocket so if we if we look at life if we look at this thing called life where we are you know we are alive we 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 don't know how we got here <laughs> but we are here you know we are alive we did not create our own life but we are alive in fact it's even difficult to define what life is but but we are alive we are alive so in the beginning of the creative process in the involution the involution of the divine mind is represented to us in in uh, our culture in the book of Genesis Genesis that God spoke its word God spoke its word and then something happened something took that word and something something got <clears throat> the pool balls rolling on the table something got the invisible energy of the universe taking form occupying space and time matter is created and matter takes the shape of stars and planets and, and then plants and animals oceans all these different things start to evolve they start to evolve but they only evolve because there was involution there was the intention of the divine mind the divine mind said let there be involution let there be and then there was evolution things unfolding 
things taking place, things bumping into one another, things are happening. And all of that, all of that seems to be leading up to the appearance of humankind, the appearance of humankind in the evolutionary scale. Thomas Troart calls, calls it the fifth kingdom, the appearance of the fifth kingdom. That we have, we have the minerals, you know, that we have the plants, the simple mosses, and, and, and plant life emerges, and then, <clears throat> and then uh, animals emerge, and then human beings emerge. But then there's a fifth step. There's a fifth step in evolution. And that fifth step, then, is what he calls the spiritual kingdom. At the fifth step, we start to awaken. We human beings, we human consciousness, we start to awaken. See, up until this point, we have been acting and reacting more out of instinct. Kind of, kind of pre-programmed, you know, chemically pre-programmed to behave in certain ways. You know, if, you, if you have, a, for example, a grapevine in your yard, you can go out and you can you can tie up the, the, the grapevines to a trellis, and in the process of doing so, some of the leaves will get turned upside down. They'll get turned away from the sun. Right? The leaves are green on the, on the top, and they're kind of gray on the bottom. And in the process of, of attaching the vines to, to the trellis, some will get turned upside down. But if you look out a few hours later, all of them have righted themselves. They have all turned so that the green side is towards the sun so they can absorb the sunlight. Purely a chemical reaction. Purely some, some intelligence, no doubt. Intelligence meaning, you know, knowing what to do that's appropriate. There's something that functioned at some level in that, in that plant. We don't believe that it thinks. We don't think that the plant said, oh, my goodness, you know, <laughs> here comes Jim again. Going to tie us up in the wrong position. We're going to have to work all afternoon to straighten it out. But nevertheless, there was something in, in the plant that sensed that it was not in the proper position and corrected that. But that's kind of simple consciousness, simple intelligence, simple chemical programming. And, and life has been working kind of at that automatic level of unfoldment all the way up until the point where the human beings start to realize, I am. I am. We start to have ideas that we are, we are spiritual in nature. So evolution, according to Troart, evolution has taken us as far as it can. The rest has to be with, through and with our conscious cooperation with the spiritual laws of the universe. We can either remain, you know, in, in the realm of the animal kingdom or we can use the same power of creation, <clears throat> the same power of involution to set our intention to say that now I am awake, now I am awakening, now I recognize that all of that all of that in the past, everything in the past was for the only purpose of bringing me to the point of awakening. And that from this moment on, from this moment on, any further advancement in my growth, in my progress, has to come through my conscious cooperation. I have to choose. I have to decide. I have to work with the, <clears throat> the tools in my spiritual toolbox with treatments, with affirmations, with visualizations, with meditations. I have to decide that I am a spiritual being and I have to behave accordingly. And what we come to recognize then is, is that in this, in this past, this process of evolution, it was necessary that we as human beings be, be left in ignorance of our spiritual nature so that we could discover it for ourselves. And by discovering it for ourselves, that we would do so in a unique manner. Right? If, we had been, if we had been born fully enlightened, 
we would not have our unique personality. We would be little automatons or robots. We would all be kind of programmed, kind of like you go to the store and you buy a computer with Windows 10 in it, and they all they all kind of come the same. And and then you have to go in and you have to personalize it. You have to make it unique. But when they come, they come all the same. They come all the same. And the way that life has been set up is is that we have been given the the responsibility of awakening, of coming out of this dream, but in doing so, we get to do it in a unique way. We get to do it in a way that only we can do it. We can develop a unique perspective, a unique personality, a unique way of looking upon creation and of celebrating the very creation of God, which is why we're here. Which is, which is kind of the reason for the creation of the, the, human, the human being in the image and likeness, we're told, in the image and likeness of the divine, according to its nature. So Dr. Holmes tells us if you, if you go to the ocean and you take a drop of water out of the ocean, the nature of that water is the very nature of the ocean. The water itself, the drop of water, is not the entire ocean. But everything that drop of water is came from the ocean. It is in the image and the likeness and the nature of the ocean. And you and I, each and everything about us, we have come from the only source of life that there is, the divine. And that spark of the divine is within us, waiting to be discovered. As we human beings have been going through this process of evolution that was necessary to take us up to the point of spiritual awakening, we have learned to believe in many things that just simply are not true. They are not true in the world of the absolute. They appear to be true because they exist as experiences in the world of the relative. We believe in apartness we believe in separation. We believe in a mixture of good and evil. We believe in duality. And it is from these that we have to awaken. It is from this dream that we have to awaken. So we come to, we can come to a point where we start to understand that we must be, because we are of the divine nature, because we are made in the image and likeness, because we are the drop of water that comes from the ocean, because we are the spark of life that comes from the universal spirit, that that must be our true nature. And because its true nature is, is that it speaks its word, it states its intention. It makes its declaration. Decides what it shall have. And then something acts upon that word and makes it so. When the divine said, let there be, something took that specific let there be and made it so, to, to put it in, in the example of Genesis. And because we are made from it, then there is that which responds to us exactly according to our belief. Exactly according to our belief. Then what happens is we, we are kind of at a, a decision point. We're at a crossroads. We're kind of where the actor in the movie, movie The Matrix was. Do we come out of the dream? Or do we go back into the dream? Do we, do we try to use our, our newfound awareness of the fact that we are spiritual beings living in a spiritual universe? Where there is something that responds to our thought and creates our experiences accordingly? Do we try to use that to create a better dream? 
as Goldsmith would say, we, we try to call God down into our human experience and say, oh God, you know, give, give me more money to make my life better. Oh, oh God, give me a bigger house. You know, Janis Joplin said, give me a Mercedes Benz. We're trying to, to use the power, the spiritual power that we start to discover. We try to use that to create a better human life. And yet at some point we have to wake up and say, no, no, the, the purpose is not to create a better human life. The purpose is to recognize is that that human life was only an experience. Just one experience. And that the purpose is to learn how to live as a spiritual being. I mean, st stop and, and think about where you have been over the course of this lifetime. And you can remember yourself as a child. You can remember yourself as a, as a teenager. You can remember yourself as a young adult. You can, re you can remember all of these different phases of life that you experience, but yet you are not any of those. Not, not one of those defines you. They are just experiences that you are passing through. Even the bodies that you had at the time are, are gone. They're no longer here. We're told that within a two-year period, every cell in the body, including the bones, has replaced itself. And all the old ones have died off, and they're the dust on the windowsills. So we are not, we are not the bodies that we had when we were children or teens or young adults. And neither are we the experience that we had. Those were simply experiences that we were passing through in this journey or on this journey and in this process of awakening, of awakening. So what we eventually must come to is we must come to this, this realization that we don't want to make the dream better. We, we don't want to use what we know uh, with regard to, to our spiritual nature in order to improve our human experience. Now, that's not to say that our human experience won't improve as, as we become more spiritually aware, but it is to say that that's not the purpose. That's not... That's not the intention. But that the reason that we have come this far, the reason that we are where we are today, is that we have been given the opportunity to more fully awaken. More fully awaken. We have to decide if we want to do that. And we have to decide that that now is the time, or if now is not the time, when is the time? You know, the famous quote from uh, Rabbi Hillel. Unfortunately, it doesn't give us any context. It just says, you know, <clears throat> if not us, who? And if not now, when? And now is the time, and we are the people. We have been brought this far and allowed allowed to kind of feel that tug that we feel when the clock goes off in the morning. Oh, it's time for me to wake up. It's time for me to get out of bed, but I'm, <clears throat> I'm not certain I want to go. And we have to come into this, this idea. We have to accept. We have to commit ourselves to this idea that yes, today, Today is the day that I step out of that dream. Today is the day that I commit myself to awaken more fully to my spiritual nature. And today is the day that I stop believing in separation. I stop believing in duality. I stop believing in mixtures of good and of evil. So for a moment, we just want to, we just want to briefly look at our, our lives today, our lives in this dream world. And we want to see how those ideas manifest themselves, the ideas of separation and of 
lack and of limitation and of duality. And it's, it's usually not hard for people, people who believe in God, who believe in a God. We, we have to be careful when, when we say we believe in God or somebody else says they believe in God. We, we need to take time to say, well, what kind of God is that? Excuse me, I had to take a drink. Because not everybody's concept of God is the same. We have to, we have to start with getting ourselves clear as to what do we mean. But it's usually not too hard for, for people who believe in, in a God to think that, well, this God is good and this God is perfect and this God has everything that there is and, and all, all of those characteristics of the divine. People believe that. Where the problem comes in for them is in believing, well, that applies to me. <clears throat> that includes me. You know, if if I am created in the image and likeness of the divine, if I am the drop of water to the ocean, then that's what's true of the ocean is true of me. What's true of the divine is true of me. And if the divine is perfect peace, then the center of my being, the essence must be perfect peace. If the divine is perfect health, then the very essence and truth of my being must be perfect health. If the divine has enough and plenty to do whatever it chooses to do in this world, in, in every world, if it can create universes out of nothing, you know, out of the unformed energy of its own self, then the very truth of my being must be that that is at the center of my being as well. But yet we don't want to believe that or we find it too difficult to believe or we look around us and we say, but the evidence, everything I see around us says no. Everything around us says no, I'm on my own. Everything around us says that, that what I get, I have to get by the sweat of my brow and I work hard for it. and I have to, I have to use my wits and my brawn in order to, to make a living. All of evidence of the senses tell us that we are separated from the very good that we are easily easily led to believe is the very nature of God so we look around us and we see that the the troubles in the world we see war and we say how can that be if God is if God is perfect peace and God is everywhere present, how can there be wars? And we see sickness and we say, how can that be? If God is everywhere present and God is perfect health, how could there possibly be sickness? And if there's poverty, we say, how can that be? You know, How can the divine have enough to feed everyone and yet people are going hungry? And it bothers us, disturbs us. First of all, through compassion, we feel for the pain and suffering of other human beings. And secondly, kind of philosophically, it bothers us because it, it is a contrast. We say God is good, God is everywhere present, yet pain and suffering exists, disease exists, poverty exists, wars exist. How can that be so? And what Joel Goldsmith tells us that I found to be very, very helpful in this regard is that just because God is everywhere present doesn't mean that the qualities of God are manifest everywhere present. That is, the presence of God has to be realized in order for the qualities of God to be demonstrated in that situation. So if we get a bunch of human beings together and they are absolutely dead set at, at going to war with one another, and their, their prayer, instead of a prayer for peace, instead of a prayer for recognizing the presence of God within themselves and within their enemies, if their prayer is, is, that, is that God will give them strength to kill the other side, then the quality of God is not recognized there. The peace of God is not recognized, it's not realized. It is human beings using human willpower to do human things. And they will continue to do that to one another 
until the awakening. Until they start to recognize the spiritual presence. Until they commit themselves to their spiritual growth. So we come to <clears throat> we come to a place then where we can we can understand that the world the world is caught up in its dream. The world is caught up in its dream of separation. We think that we are separated from our spiritual nature. We think that we are separated from the very God that created us and is everywhere present. We believe that there's duality. Right? We believe that somehow there's a power of good and a power of evil. And that somehow the one, the one God that created all of us allows us to exist. As I said at the beginning, some, some <clears throat> philosophies, some theologies think that God is all-powerful, but God allows, allows the evil to exist to tempt us and torment us to find out who's good and who's not. But in the end, good will ultimately prevail. Duality. There is no power of evil. There's only one power. There's only unity. There's only God. The evil seems to exist because it is a belief. It is a belief in human consciousness. We accept that. And because we accept it and because we believe in it, it manifests itself in our experience. Emma Curtis Hopkins asked us to consider our ideas of mixtures of good and evil and lack and limitation. You know, and we <laughs> I love the way she puts it. We we think that God is omniscience. God God knows everything. Complete intelligence, right? Everything there is to know the divine mind knows. And God is omnipresence. God is everywhere present, which means that the presence, that the intelligence, the wisdom of God is everywhere present, except in those people we don't like. They are complete idiots. Yeah, they are. They are the dummies. Somehow, you know, like the old joke when God was handing out brains, <clears throat> they thought they thought he said trains, and they went down to the station. You know. We have to give up these, these prejudices. We have to give up these ideas of lack and limitation. We have to give up these ideas of duality. And we have to be willing to turn our back to all of that. And that's what, that's what we're trying to get to today. See, we know about it. We hear about it. We talk about it. We read about it. But now's the time to do it. Now is the time to make our practice deliberately dismissing <coughs> I think it's <coughs> excuse me Don Miguel in the Four Agreements says that that which you don't uh, disagree with you have you have silently agreed with are we willing to look at the circumstances that the world presents to us today and to call them out for what they are Lies pretending to be the truth. Appearances but not realities. Conditions that don't need to exist and they will go away when the presence of God is realized. And then can we do the one thing that we, the only thing that we can do that will make a lasting change? Which is to realize the presence of God. I mean, think about it. If all of our problems are problems of duality, if all of our problems are because we are stuck in the dream of separation, if all of our problems are due to the fact that we believe in a mixture of good and evil, then the only thing that is going to solve the problems is the realization of the falsehood of those arguments. I mean, look at how look at how the world has been trying to solve solve its problems for all of our recorded history, and I, and I would suggest that our earliest recorded history is probably is probably history of violence. 
one side gains power and tries to put the other side down and then over time the pendulum shifts and it just goes back and it goes forth and it goes back and it goes forth and it goes back and it goes forth because both sides believe in the duality. Both sides believe in the separation. Both sides believe in the mixture of good and evil. And it is not going to be until <clears throat> the separation, the duality, and the mixture are dissolved through the realization of the unity that that will stop. This is nothing new. I mean, this is what this is what we've been told for thousands of years. You know, pray for your enemies, bless your enemies, recognize that we are one, treat each other with compassion because we are one. Don't don't think of everybody else as being separate and apart. Think of us all as being, being in this journey together. So we kind of come to a point where we have to realize that this isn't the kind of thing you can just, you can just think about once in a while. You know the the analogy that came to me um, this morning when I was I was kind of sitting and listening to these ideas. If you've ever had a teenager go from high school to college, whether it be your own or a member of the family or just, just a friend or somebody you knew, but if you ever had a teenager go from, from high school to college, there's typically a rude awakening when they get there. There's, there's typically kind of a shock right? because most kids are able to go through high school without working too awfully hard. They can get acceptable grades. Some of them can even get good grades. But they don't have to work as hard as they have to work when they get to college. And then when they get to college, they think, well, I'll just keep doing everything that the way I was doing it in high school. And of course, college treats the kids a lot differently. The teacher gives them a syllabus and expects them to read it and do what the syllabus says. They didn't have to do that in high school. They take the syllabus and they stick it in a drawer somewhere. And then after a while, they start missing assignments and failing and they can wonder what happened here well you didn't do what, what needed to be done you know panic drop courses drop school all kinds of things happen until there's a realization that it takes effort until there's a realization that they have to apply themselves and this is what Dr. Holmes is telling us if, if you want to explore more of these ideas uh, go to page 106 of the textbook and, and read the chapter there about how man reenacts the nature of the universe. He tells us that our effort has to be conscious and our effort has to be persistent. We can't just keep walking in a dream and every once in a while saying, oh, well, that's not real. Oh, that's not necessary. Oh, that, sh that shouldn't be. And then go back to the dream. We have to be persistent. We have to be dedicated. We have to be. We have to be like that student who has had the rude awakening and says, "Oh my God, this this is going to take some time. This is going to take some conscious effort. I can't just stop for a couple minutes in the morning and then run out and go to work and do everything the same way I had been. I have to remind myself as often as I can that I am a spiritual being." that everything that is unfolding is a projection of consciousness and that I do the very best thing that I can do to improve the situation for everyone, which is to bring my consciousness to a consciousness of unity. So this is where we come to the point we say, well, <clears throat> how, do we, how do we get out of that dream and how do we stay out of that dream? And we have to apply ourselves. We have to decide that we want to do it. We have to commit ourselves to doing the work. And then we have to use the tools in our spiritual toolbox. Spiritual mind treatment starts with the very, with the very assumption that God is already good and we are associated with that. Every time we treat, we are dissolving the ideas of separation. <clears throat> we, we are dissolving the ideas of duality. We need to do that as often as we can. Not because we want the stuff to come to us, but because we want to use that technique in order to dissolve the ideas of separation. We can use meditation in order to allow ourselves to observe 
our mind at work so we can recognize how our mind plays tricks on us by telling us that the dream is real. We can use our affirmations to constantly remind ourselves of the way that we know that it really is, but we don't quite see it yet. And we can use visualization, which Ernest Holmes called visual treatment, <coughs> in order to see things as they truly are. We know what it is that we can do. We know how to do it. We have the tools, we have the techniques. We know that we have to do it because no one can do it for us. <coughs> There's no fairy godmother with a magic wand who's going to come and tap us on the shoulder and say, you're enlightened. You've awakened. This is something that only we can do for ourselves when we decide to do it for ourselves. <coughs> Excuse me. So I, I invite you to consider this week, I invite you to consider, is now the time for you? Is it time to, to step out of, out of that dream? Are we, like the, are we like the person who's going down a stream with one foot in each canoe? The canoe of the dream and the canoe of the spiritual reality. And we're going down the stream with one foot in each canoe and we're kind of pretty content until we come to a rock in the middle of the stream. And then we have to make up our mind. Most people go back into the old canoe. Most people will go back into the old ways. Are we willing to commit ourselves to put both feet into our spiritual canoe? To recognize that the world in which we live is, is only something that we're passing through. It is only an environment that exists because it was the perfect environment for us to come to a point of awakening. And now that we realize that, we are ready to commit ourselves to that awakening. We are ready to swing our feet off the edge of the bed and get up and let go of the dream. I think this is the reason that we're here. I think this is the reason that we have come. I think this is what spiritual teachers for thousands of years have been telling us and the techniques that they have been giving to us are for that purpose. So I invite you now to consider if this is the time for you. And if so, then how will you do it? Will you schedule 20 minutes in the morning and 20 minutes in the evening for treatment? Will you, will you schedule periods during the day where you'll stop and remind yourselves? <clears throat> Many traditions ask, ask their adherents to pray five times a day. Goldsmith asks his, his students to meditate five times a day. Are we willing to do whatever we need to do to constantly remind ourselves throughout the course of the day that what we're looking at is only an appearance? It is not the ultimate reality. And that our desire, our intention, our involution is that every day, every single day, we grow more and more fully into our spiritual awakening. That's why we're here. And so it is.